Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Professor Lamy, welcome. Uh, you see, we have real beautiful snow welcoming you to outside of this, uh, this hall. I have prepared a speech. I usually don't do that. That shows how much I respect you. On December 11th, 2001, exactly 22 years ago to yesterday, China joined the WTO after going through a very difficult negotiation process. In fact, out of this very long negotiation process, two years was with Professor Nami, and he was representing the European side at that time. I'm a county professor, so I like to use numbers to make my point. I did some calculation in the morning. According to the World Bank data, using 2015 counseling price, China's real GDP in 2001 was one MB 18.69 trillion. And uh, it is 101.67 trillion last year which increased 4.4 four times over 22 years. The real GDP growth rate over this time period is 8.4%, and the per capita GDP, real GDP growth for Chinese was 7.86% per year. More than 800 million people moved out of poverty in China. Western countries have also greatly benefited from international trade. Hundreds of millions of consumers in Western countries enjoyed cheap and reliable product. And business have enjoyed high growth in profit and revenue. Let me give you one example. For the fiscal year in 2001, Apple Computer reported a net loss of 25 million US dollars on revenue of 5.36 billion US dollars. And last year, Apple Company had a net profit of 99.8 billion US dollars. Out of revenue, 394 billion dollars. And we know that China is a very big manufacturing base for Apple and also is a huge market for Apple. One regret I had is uh, I actually owned some Apple shares. I sold them in 2004. If I didn't sell, let me tell you how much the price has increased. From the end of 2001 to yesterday, Apple share price has increased 585 times. Global trade in the past few decades is a successful story. This seems a non-controversial statement. However, a disturbing change has taken place in the past few years. Free trade has lost support in many Western countries. The US government has set up heavy tariffs on trade with China, and especially for export, export of high technology to China. Global supply chain have been seriously disrupted. Huge uncertainties have been imposed on global economy. What were the causes of this unfortunate development? What China and the EU can do to revitalize multilateral trade? In fact, tonight, the dialogue, I prepared this title, Global Trade, History, Current Debate and the Future. Professor Lamy, 
He didn't like very much of this title, so he had an alternative suggestion. What the EU and China can do to revitalize multilateral trade? I think that is a better one, the one with a little bit of hope. I hope our dialogue tonight can bring us some positive hope. Okay. Professor, let me, we are, I think we have invited the best authority in this field tonight to give, uh, to share the reason to help us to answer those questions. So we are very happy to have you here, Professor Lamy. The arrangement is very simple tonight. Professor Lamy will give a 30 minutes presentation with no interruption. And uh, then we will have a 30 minutes dialogue. And we leave 30 minutes to answer questions from the audience. Professor Lamy does not need an uh, introduction. I just want to emphasize that from 2005 to 2013, Professor Lamy served two consecutive terms as Director General of the World Trade Organization. And uh, he is a former Trade Commissioner of the European Commission. Currently, Professor Lamy holds many important positions. He is the Vice President of the Paris Peace Forum, coordinator of the Jackish Deleuze think tank, but the dearest of all to the CEIBS community is very simple. He is one of our professors. So Professor Lamy, let's welcome, he joins, come to the stage. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Very happy to be back in China after a few years where I was, uh, as the Dean just said, frustrated. Uh, the last time I came to China was in December 2019 uh, to teach in uh, Shanghai and Shenzhen at the time at the CIBS, which is a, a position I'm very honored uh, to have been uh, given, uh, knowing the huge success that uh, CIBS has, uh, the manner it has grown, the reputation it now has. It's an honor for me to be associated uh, with uh, this institution, the birth of which is a story uh, I shared uh, with uh, both uh, the president and the dean a moment ago. You just said, uh, Mr. Dean, that you had uh, chosen a title and that, that I had uh, chosen another title. I belong, I hope, uh, to a category of people who can change their mind. If they believe, they have to. So I've changed my mind and I've taken your title. Now, I've changed nearly all my mind because I've done a bit of mix between your title and my title, which is, I think, a, a fair compromise. So, I will uh, briefly uh, develop uh, three thoughts, three points. The first one has to do, uh, which is uh, where we are in terms of uh, what has shaped global trade uh, in uh, history. Second one uh, will be about the uh, Current, the current debate about global trade and globalization. And we know that we are in a uh, rather specific period. And the third one uh, will be uh, more daring 
uh, which is uh, what should the uh, EU and China do in the future uh, to handle this uh, new situation. Now, if I start with a very broad brush of what have been and are the shaping uh, factors of global trade, I will uh, give three shaping factors, technology, ideology, and political power. I think those are the three shaping factors which throughout history uh, have uh, formatted global trade patterns, starting uh, with uh, technology, uh, the expansion of global trade has always been following a technological jump in uh, transport, uh, which is why it's easy to understand that given for a very long time the main obstacle to trade was distance, each time distance shrunk trade fostered. It was the case uh, with the first big invention in uh, navigation, uh, the uh, stern uh, soda, uh, which allowed uh, ships uh, to sail uh, upwind as well as downwind. Uh, historians say, by the way, that this invention uh, dates from the Han dynasty, in China. Then came uh, the steam uh, revolution, and it was a French guy who discovered that uh, steam uh, could be converted in uh, power. Then, of course, uh, machines, and steam navigation, then air transport, and then finally uh, internet, uh, which was uh, invented by Mr. Berners-Lee uh, in the 1950s or 60s, followed by the invention of the container, followed uh, by the uh, invention of the rolling luggage. And you have to understand that the invention of the container and the invention of the rolling luggage, which do not seem to be rocket science, fundamentally changed the capacity and ability uh, to transport uh, people, goods or luggage, uh, which opened the whole tourist market to elder people that before that were handicapped in traveling uh, because they had to carry their luggage. So it sometimes is not about big inventions. Technology has formatted trade flows to a point where we now have a zero distance to transmit something that has a high value uh, which is uh, a software or a set of data, one click, one second. Uh, this is where we are uh, now. And this, of course, has a big influence on the way uh, trade flows. Second uh, big shaping factor, ideology. There has always been, uh, throughout uh, history, a debate uh, between uh, those who believe uh, open trade is the way to go and those who believe that uh, mercantilism is the way to go. I won't dwell uh, too much into the details of this uh, debate. Uh, let's simply understand the two sides of the equation. On the one side, Ricardo, Schumpeter, and a few uh, theoricians uh, showed that if I do something better than you do, and you do something better than I do, we have a rational interest to trade. I will benefit from uh, your know-how, you will benefit from my know-how. It's a win-win situation, so let's trade. Now, of course, those who in your constituency 
are doing what I do better than them will always be happy, and the other way around. So this very simple equation uh, explains why opening trade is both efficient, win-win, but painful for those who have to adjust. And the other side of the equation about whether trade should be open or not is more attentive to the problems created in a constituency uh, when trade is open and some of those who have to change uh, are not happy with that. And this is why, in a way, mercantilism, which is I will open trade only when it's to my obvious short-term comparative advantage, and not generally, uh, sometimes, sometimes, uh, won uh, the debate, and you have a very good example of that, let's say in the middle of the 19th century, between uh, France and the uh, UK, at a time where steam shipping totally changed the relative prices of uh, US grains in the European market. At the time, the British uh, thought was led uh, by Mr. Cobden, uh, who made the case that putting a tariff to protect grain producers in UK was stupid because that would make the price of bread higher and that for poor people making the price of bread higher was making them poorer. It's also true that at the time the UK property was with landlords. They resisted but they lost this battle. So there was no tariff ring and poor people in UK benefited from open trade. The French reaction was opposite not least because in France the land property had been uh, fragmented by uh, the uh, legislation during the French Revolution and in order to protect small, small farmers the French erected a tariff against US grain now cheaper because of steam city. So this is a good example of why sometimes it worked in one direction and sometime in another direction. And then the uh, third uh, element, uh, of course, is uh, power. You cannot totally separate economic patterns from political uh, positions of power. And we've seen that uh, all the time. Uh, the Roman Empire was a place where trade was governed by the emperor. It was the same uh, during uh, various uh, colonial episodes, the British uh, colonization, the French colonization. Uh, even people were traded at the time. Huh? Slavery is a form of trade, it's a form of abject trade, but it was the result of uh, colonial uh, capacity. And we also know that sometimes trade is used, and notably sanctions or bans uh, or embargoes for purely political reasons when a power wants another power uh, to do something different. So that takes me to my second point, uh, which is where we are now. And my point here is that we are at a moment where the respective weight of these three shaping factors has changed. We are at an inflection point in globalization between uh, yesterday and today and tomorrow. Yesterday, let's say before 2010 roughly, uh, was a situation where these three shaping factors were pushing in the same direction. Technology with digitalization, a big push 
to uh, international exchange. Ideology, the consensus at the time was that opening trade was the way to go. And this resulted in a massive reduction of obstacle to trade during, let's say, uh, the 50 years of this big globalization process of uh, multi-localization of production systems that enhance trade, that benefit from trade, international division of labor, guided by the efficiency of uh, uh, localizing production where it is uh, the most efficient, hence producing a lot of trade. The average tariff, just to take an example, was roughly 30 or 35%. After the Second World War, in 2010, the average trade weight of tariff was around 5%. Now, tariff is not the only obstacle to trade. There are many others. I mentioned distance, which is in somehow disappearing. But there's also subsidies or regulations. But all this, during this period, moved to a massive reduction of obstacle to trade because a large majority thought that opening trade was the way to go. And as for power, at the time, it was a time where geopolitical rivalries uh, were uh, much less tense than before. The main episode of this uh, moment uh, was uh, the fall of the Berlin Wall, uh, when liberal capitalism was seen as having won the battle. And at the time, many people thought that now that was the way to go. Some even, as you may have heard, uh, called this uh, the end of history. So that was a period where technology, ideology, power, games pushed in the direction of a very rapid form of globalization. This uh, has changed and this is not what we see today. And the reason uh, why it is not what we see today is that these three shaping factors technology, power games, and ideology have changed. Whereas the three of them push, pushed in the same direction in the previous period, now two of them are pushing in the other direction. Now, the one that keeps pushing in the same direction is technology. The world is more connected than ever, and will be even more connected uh, in the future. And this is driving a lot of international exchange, notably as progressively economies uh, move uh, from adding value uh, in manufacturers, starting with agriculture, then manufacture, then services. And we know that in the services area, digitalization is pushing a lot of new products, new applications, uh, new softwares. Uh, so this is, keeps pushing globalization and global trade forward. It's different for uh, power games and for ideology, power games. And finally, uh, ideology. Uh, the notion that open trade is the way to go is less in fashion, as uh, the Dean uh, said in his introduction, uh, than in the past, for a variety of reasons, uh, which uh, have to do with security. As if, and economists uh, will know that, as if suddenly the price of risk had inflated. Hence, influencing relative prices in uh, many of uh, economic operations. 
It is the case for national security. You have a number of trade measures that are restricting trade on the grounds of national security. If the US uh, believe uh, that they should uh, ban uh, semiconductors of the large generation uh, for China, it's because of national security. Not just national security, economic security. COVID showed in some circumstances that these very complex supply chains that had spanned the world during the previous period of globalization could be fragile. They had to be made more resilient, and this leads to trade measures, the purpose of which is to make uh, these value chains uh, more resilient, i.e., in some cases, reshoring operations that had been uh, offshore. You also have conversation and the issues about access to critical raw material following from uh, the uh, fight against uh, climate change. So national security, economic security, social security in some places, and notably in the US, who have a rather weak social system, some of the US uh, citizens or workers have been hit by globalization in condition that they were not properly taken care of. And this has created an anti-trade resentment. And I think one cannot understand the election of Mr. Trump in 2016 without factoring in this sort of reaction. And finally, and uh, maybe importantly for the future, environmental security. The priority given now to climate change is done in such a way that we roughly all agree that we should uh, decarbonize our economies, but we do it in a totally different way. Uh, we Europeans do it in pricing carbon. The Americans do it in subsidization. Now, if we price carbon at 110 euros a ton in the European Union, trading with trade partners that have a zero or 10 uh, euro a ton uh, carbon price is incentivizing carbon leakage. Huh? If we maintain this situation, people will stop producing in the European Union and they will go and produce and emit carbon, by the way, elsewhere. So all these things have led to a change of mind, which is where we are now, uh, not in a deglobalization. I do not think we are in a process of deglobalization. And by the way, if you look at the numbers, the volumes of international trade have never been so high. Huh? This is what you see in reading the proper numbers. So not a deglobalization, not a situation where global trade will shrink, but it will be more fragmented, more decoupled, more de-risked in a way. So, all in all, a more globalized, but also more fragmented, more, more divided world, which is where we are now, uh, which I personally believe is a dangerous place. Now, what does this mean? And that's my last point. What does this mean uh, for the future of uh, EU-China relationship at large, given that I do not think you can separate economics and politics, and certainly not geoeconomics and geopolitics. And what has happened in this recent period is that geoeconomics had a sort of upper hand of geo on geopolitics for some time, and the balance has shifted the other way around. The Chinese people and their leadership, but what I know as a European is that Europe moving to a more autonomous strategic capacity will happen, it will happen, but it will take time. And the time it takes for European countries to agree, and the time it takes for Americans to realize that their own interest would be that Europe takes on board more of its capacity to defend itself. Now, the situation is also uh, complex 
uh, on the economic side, this uh, 400 uh, billion uh, euros uh, trade deficit uh, is there to show that there is a problem. And the problem, in uh, our view, uh, stems from the fact that uh, the, Chinese, the Chinese economy has a macroeconomic problem, uh, which is uh, that, roughly speaking, uh, Chinese people save too much, do not consume enough, and a large part of the overcapacity of the Chinese production system then has to go to foreign markets. Uh, this is our basic understanding of why China has such a large trade surplus. And by the way, it's the same reason why the Americans have such a large deficit overall, because American people don't save enough. So they consume a lot, and they consume more than they produce, so they have a big uh, trade uh, deficit. Now, this Chinese characteristic, and we have to uh, recognize that there are Chinese characteristics, is a long-term problem. This assuming it could change, and that was the intention behind the theory of a dual circulation, which, let's be frank, has not worked. Assuming this can change, this will only change slowly in the capacity of the Chinese economic and political system to provide enough social security to the Chinese so that they save less and consume more. So, and again, this is something that might change, not for me to decide, but if it does change, it will change slowly. So, these parameters say that we are in for a bumpy uh, relationship uh, in the times to come, and yet, and this is my uh, final point, and yet, and yet, I am absolutely convinced that the EU-China relationship is a very important one for the future if we want, let's say, peace to prevail above war. This, I believe, is the way to go. I was telling uh, to uh, my friends at CIBS about the conversation which I attended in July uh, 1986 uh, between uh, Chairman Deng Xiaoping and uh, Delors, who at the time uh, was uh, the president of the EU Commission, and I was his chief of staff, and I attended this meeting when they discussed whether a stronger EU-China relationship uh, was necessary or not. Now, what they exchanged at the time 1986, that's a long time ago, is exactly what I believe today. Uh, it is in the interest of China to make of Europe a larger political and influential body, and it is in the interest of EU to entertain with China a relationship which is not first and foremost driven by the notion that we are rivals and maybe sometimes enemies. This is something which I believe is absolutely crucial. I have said, and I think we have to be lucid, it won't be easy in the times to come, but I think this is the way to go. And there is one area where there is a major potential for growing rapidly this relationship, uh, which is the environment. The fight against climate change is an area where Europeans and Chinese agree. We are both convinced that this is of our making, that we have to fix it, and that this entails a considerable revolution, which China has started extremely efficiently, notably in moving to green tech. I still travel uh, all over the place on this planet, north, south, and elsewhere, and it's west. There are not two places on this planet where the ideological component of fighting against climate change is 
as similar as Europe and China. And I think this is, in my view, uh, the, most, uh, the largest potential of cooperation, whether it's science, whether it's about how to handle the decarbonation of our economies, whether it's how to use uh, green tech uh, to, uh, to move to renewables, and not just for climate, but also for biodiversity. So, in a nutshell, and that's my final point, I'm not very optimistic short term, but I think long term there is a major potential which, after all, we all need to move very rapidly forward. Thanks for your attention. Professor Lamy just made a very interesting uh, presentation. Actually, there are many points worth really deep, much deeper. <laughs> okay, so in my introduction, I, I made an assessment about whether uh, free trade globalization is a successful story, a failure for the past 20 years, 30 years, maybe 50 years. Clearly, from my personal view, also maybe for look at China's interest, this is a overwhelming success. But for you as a former commissioner of EU and also as a secretary, uh, director general of WDO, and uh, not just look at from my like Chinese view, what's your assessment? Is it a success? Uh, something maybe really wrong, maybe we should change? My own answer to that is very simple. I totally agree that it was a formidable success. And by the way, this success was so formidable that it was totally unexpected. One of the reasons why we have some of these political, geopolitical turbulences is the speed with which China became a major world power and economy. It is totally uh, unprecedented in history. Uh, the impact it has had on not just the size of the economy of China, but the well-being of the Chinese people and the social uh, impact it has had, and you, yeah, your numbers are absolutely right. So. Yes, it is a formidable success, but A, because it was formidable, it became a problem for the US. And that's a consequence of this extremely fast success. And second, uh, what happened uh, around, let's say, roughly 10, 15 years ago, when China, which had reformed and opened consistently between uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, and, let's say, uh, 2010, and which is the reason, in my view, of this formidable success. Uh, thank you. I'm very happy to hear you say, overall, Global trade is a successful story, but we have challenges to face in the future. Part of it is uh, the change is too fast. At adjusting cost can be high, and uh, we have some policy to we have to make an adjustment. Perhaps you have heard recently the Chinese government uh, announced that we will try to open even wider and welcome uh, foreign company to to operate in China and. Uh, uh, it was announced just a few weeks ago, quite a few points. I hope this will uh, play some uh, rule and have some effect. And in fact, precisely because of this rapid change, the fast growth of China has created a lot of fear in um, 
many other countries, and in particular in the U.S. So this led to decoupling now, they use different words. I just heard this is the European side. You're pushing on this de uh, so the Americans should listen to what you say. And I think this is a good example to show that Europe should play a much bigger role. Because sometimes the Americans do listen to what the Europeans say. And unfortunately, I think academic world, we play the role, not myself, and some of our colleagues in the, in, in the American universities. And I think when you and I, we start the macroeconomics, free trade is not a controversial. As you just said, uh, trade is based on competitive advantage. That's why when we started in China, we produce shirts. Americans play airplane, and also French play, uh, produce airplane. That's good, it benefits, it will always benefit both sides of trade. What happened? In 2004, a very influential economist, and you and I, we're all familiar, Samuelson, Paul Samuelson, he of course is Nobel Prize winner. One year before he died, when he was 89 years old, he wrote the article. He changed this assumption about free trade. He was saying, on a static term, free trade is always good for both sides. But the terms of trade can change. China, for example, can move to develop our technology and also produce airplanes. Samuelson actually used more to show that if the less developed country grow too fast, can make the developed economy worse off. I think that article really scared the Americans and even changed the perceptions in the real world as well as in the academic world. My question to you is, suppose what Samuelson said was true. If the less developed country moves too fast, it can create a challenge for the developed countries. What should be the position taken by the advanced economy? The Americans are doing, okay, let's build up a wall. We'll protect ourselves. I would say maybe the more rational way is we embrace the change. We innovate. We work harder. We prosper together. So assume Americans would listen to you. What would be your advice to the Americans? And also to some of the Europeans. Because we heard the same thing for European countries, several of them. No, I mean, what I see is that what we, what both of us believe is attributed to open trade and globalization, which is more interdependence, more complementarity, a more clever arrangement of production factors that makes this globalization more efficient is seen as a positive when you trade with people which you feel are not enemies. The moment you change your glasses and you look at your trading partner as a possible enemy, then the benefits of interdependence switch to a problem. We have become too interdependent because if the others want to hit our economy, they will use the dependence I have vis-a-vis -vis them against me. And by the way, this is one of the reasons why China itself had a de-risking policy with the 2025 industrial plan, with the uh, uh, big push with a lot of state uh, resources uh, on uh, technology. So the real change is not the fact that trade has become more or less efficient. It, I think it's always efficient, but but the perception that in trading more with a partner you are 
risking something that has to do with your national security changes the equation. So at the end of the day, now I'm not the one who will say whether the US are right or whether China is right. What I see is that the US see they are vulnerable to China and China sees it is vulnerable to the US. This is the simultaneity of these two feelings which creates this situation. Now, we Europeans, as I said, I mean, we're not Americans, obviously, we share a lot of things with them, including uh, our security, uh, which is uh, a big thing. Uh, we, I mean, they were born out of, uh, out of uh, European uh, culture and tradition, but we have different ways of life. I mean, the European social system is very different from the American one, sometimes uh, less efficient uh, in terms of uh, working hours, for instance, that is true, but it yet remains the situation that lots of people on this planet would like to live in Europe. So we, we have something which is a tradition, uh, let's say uh, at least uh, uh, we've indicated uh, happiness, which, which distinguishes us from a form of capitalism in the US which is uh, much more violent, much more brutal. Uh, you know the US. Huh? You have your chance, you succeed. Good for you. You don't. Uh, too bad for you. Uh, you, you, you have tried. You have, it hasn't worked. Well, I'm not going to take care about you because you failed. We have a very different philosophy uh, in, the, in Europe. And yet, and yet, in many ways, Europe is caught in this uh, fight, uh, rivalry, and there are other, by the way, emerging countries like India or Indonesia or Brazil or South Africa that share this view. But, I mean, in my discussions with, with, with Chinese officials, you know, I'm always told, yeah, but you have, Europeans have to respect Chinese characteristics. And I, I agree with that. I mean, China is China. It's a formidably long history. It has its own characteristics, including its political system. But I think China should also consider that there are European characteristics which are not U.S. characteristics. I, I fully agree with you. I think trade is not just about trade. It has uh, many different implications. Uh, security, in particular, is important. But I still feel a lot of uh, the problem we are facing now is because our irrational fear and our misunderstanding about the other side. And I'm very glad you said about we should, do, we should work together to understand each other better. That is really difficult. And uh, so I think as China European International Business School, we should really work hard to increase the understanding between the European people and the Chinese people. That's difficult. But at least we should make the politicians on both sides to understand each other's concern better. And uh, remember, I took you today, the first five minutes, I took you to see our professor's office. This building was designed by a Spanish architect. It is an international award-winning design, so it's not bad. I like this building. However, you have seen the window. The window for all professors' offices is very narrow. Okay, why? Because in Spain, sun, sunlight is very harsh. So this arch architect, the international winner number one, he designed a building in Beijing, used the same idea for a Spain with very harsh sunlight. Everybody understand in Beijing, we want to have a bigger window, we want to have more sunlight. So I think that shows us that we have a long way to go to, in, to increase people's understanding. And that's why and, uh, we are so happy. And uh, you, you give the, we have the dialogue and I give presentation to, to our uh, friends or students here. And uh, if you want to respond, that's fine. Otherwise, I will move to the next subject. Next subject. Yes, go ahead. Okay. And you talked about the climate 
this this conference in Dubai and the environment issue. That is a terribly important issue because if the ice of Greenland all melt and Shanghai will be gone, Shenzhen will be gone, I think also Paris maybe is will be also gone. So you said this is the issue maybe can we unite European and China together. And of course I think this is the issue can unite China and the US together. At the meeting in Dubai this time it is the Chinese representative and the American representative working together to make sure we have jobs ready. And you also said that in China we have developed some really good technology in new energy. But you also talked about and the high deficit between European side and China. And we also heard the news that some European politicians are talking about impose restrictions on Chinese uh, new energy product. I understand why you have this concern because the deficit is really green fast. However, I would like to argue that be a little bit more patient. The deficit increase for two, maybe two major reasons. Number one, China's economy is very weak now. So we don't have a sufficient demand for foreign product. Number two, your production in many countries was not very strong. That created a deficit. I don't want to see the European side start to restrict China's new technology, new energy. I think this is something as a human, Together, we should really pick the best technology working together to serve the world. What's your response? Well, first, as I said in uh, my final point, this is an area where I think we are ideologically aligned. And this is very important because it's the number one problem of this planet. I, I spent last week in Dubai uh, at the COP, discussing trade, discussing the ocean, discussing the cryosphere, discussing agriculture, discussing the Climate Overshoot Commission, which uh, I have chaired for the last uh, two years, and which produced a report uh, that made uh, quite a bit of noise uh, mid-September. And we had, by the way, a formidable Chinese member of this commission, Professor Shui Lan, with whom I will be talking uh, like we do it uh, today, tomorrow. So this is the problem number one, and it is the area where we are aligned. And this is a good start huh? in, a, in a, an equation which is very difficult with many parameters, with many reasons of uh, turbulences or friction, that's a, a capital first. Now, why do uh, the Europeans have a problem uh, with uh, importing uh, lots of uh, Chinese EVs? Is A, because of what you said. You said, given that the consumption is weak, we have to export a lot. The reason why you have to export a lot is that you produce much more than what you consume. And the reason why you produce much more than what you consume is that you build over capacities because of your not so market driven system. It is partially market driven. But if it was market driven, these over capacities would not be there. Huh? Because I won't invest in a huge capex for building <laughs> an EV uh, factory if, if I'm not sure I'm going to sell my stuff. And as you know, there is a lot of subsidization. And by the way, as we all know, Chinese provinces are competing with each other in building uh, over capacity. In, in this area. So this is a problem. And it's not just a problem because of, of this macro characteristic of China. It's a problem because if you look at EVs, where else is the market open? Not the US, not Japan. Huh? 
not markets surrounding the EU, like Turkey, for instance. So, in a way, we are the only big, deep, rich market where trading in EVs is so easy. And this is simply not sustainable. And the reason, one of the reasons why the others have closed, in a way, is that the over-regulation, the regulation of trade by the WTO is less efficient than it used to be. And this is because of notably Mr. Trump putting a big tariff on steel, aluminium, and cars. So you know, this, this is an equation which is very difficult to solve. While we recognize, while we recognize that China has done a fantastic job in moving its value addition to the frontier of green tech. I, I mean, we have a debate in Europe, for instance, about PVs, uh, whether we should keep open, as we are, to Chinese PV stuff. I am of the view that, given that PVs are now commoditized, buying good Chinese PVs is the way to go. Not these, by the way, because in this, this is a business where for one job in the industry, you have five jobs in services because of installation, maintenance. So I think it's a good deal. But you have people in Europe who say, oh, oh we've become too dependent on Chinese on PVs. And if Chinese, the exports of PVs, like, by the way, China is doing it here and there on critical materials. So, again, I think if we are where we are, I believe we are on the environment, we should find a way to fix this problem. We should find a way for EU to import Chinese EVs. I'm all in favor of that, but not to a point that it destroys the EU car industry. There, is, there, are, there are ways to do that. Huh? These things can be discussed. They can be even negotiated. I, uh, I, I cannot say I'm a complete agree, but I'm a sympathetic to what you said. <laughs> um, but I think we, we can see some things are changing in China. Number one, why, if you look at the data, the deficit, well, the trade surplus of China increased so fast. A big part of this is uh, we are not optimistic about the domestic market, so people don't have full confidence about the economy in the short term. I hope this uh, will change. Another factor for this uh, trade surplus is a uh, high saving rate for people in my generation maybe in some of their generation. But if you look at the Chinese younger people in their 20s, they don't save much. So just be patient and don't do something really harsh. Do you, uh, do you throw away the babies? I really think for, for the new energy is something we should really protect. And because this is really something can save the, the earth for all of us. And uh, you, you talked about long-term optimistic, short-term pessimistic, something like that. I, I, uh, if we look back 20 years, 30 years, we can see how fast their opinion, even political position for different countries can, can change. I remember the time I wrote that book, I, I read that book, of The World is Flat. At that time, we thought, well, the world is moving together. Now we are talking about, well, reduce dependency on other countries. As an influential politician, is self-sufficient, self-sufficiency, something so important. Every country has to spend such a big effort to achieve. And maybe we should say, let's reduce our fear about others, have more dependency on each other. Maybe the world will become a better place. I mean, I would uh, sign this uh, declaration. And I've always thought that 
I love individual passions, music, love, art, sport, whatever. I dislike collective passions. This is where we have a problem. The moment the reason which prevails in economic behavior, like trading, not because we love each other, but because it's our interest. The moment we start not trusting each other, this rationality disappears. And this, this is the problem. So, how can we rebuild the trust that has disappeared? This, in my view, is the big question. And it's, it's a huge question. It has to do with global governance. It has to do with the way our system of global governance and institutions, which was built after the Second World War, has not adjusted to today's reality. I can understand why China does not like uh, to have uh, just a bit more than uh, Belgium uh, in the share of the IMF. It's stupid. I can understand why India is unhappy not to have a, a, a security uh, council permanent seat. It's stupid. Uh, so there are, there are elements of this kind which, in my view, we should and could put on the table. And, and I know that there is a, quite a large resentment among a number of non-Western countries that the Western system is still too powerful as compared to the reality of, of economic and population today. So it's, it's, not, it's not totally, I mean, it's not a lost cause. But we have, in my view, to be more attentive at this problem of loss of trust and more attentive at the way we can build back this necessary trust. And by the way, um, um, some of you may have read uh, the book of uh, Kevin Rudd, uh, who's a former uh, Australian uh, Prime Minister and now uh, their ambassador in Washington about the US-China relationship. And his basic point and the way he demonstrate his argument is he proposes a series of measures that would rebuild trust between uh, US and China. After all, if I'm afraid of you and you give me a signal that you may not be my enemy, uh, maybe I'd be ready to do a bit of that on my side. And then we will be uh, to a second stage and then to a third stage. This, in my view, is the way to go. The, the, the real issue is the, the dominating factor in that US and China have to prove to the other that they are not the enemy they believe they are. Yeah, I think actually most of what you said I agree, and I'm also quite pessimistic. But still, I'm, I'm trying to work hard to find some bright spots for our audience today. I think uh, the new president of the European Union was in Beijing last Thursday talking to uh, President Xi Jinping. And so, so the travel is uh, back into normal. After the four years, you're finally back to China. And we have opened uh, visa-free travel to six countries, including France, I hope. We promise the audience we will give them 30 minutes to, Fine. to answer the questions. Uh, I'm sorry we had too much fun, so now it's already a little bit too late. Now, so any questions you want to ask uh, Professor Lamy? Yeah. Uh, uh, Chicho 
这个 WTO 的成功，所以呢，我非常感谢 WTO， 感谢拉米教授。那我有两个问题，第一个就是，抱歉啊，因为时间关系，我们只提一个问题，谢谢。而且一个问题，好，那就是这个，呃，现在美国对中国的半导体芯片呢，采取了这么多的限制和制裁措施，那么我认为这是明显违反 WTO 规则的。那么 WTO 对这种有什么办法？能够阻止或者减少对这个非议政策的措施，谢谢。I I really think this is a fantastic question. You are the former、uh, director general of WTO. Now something is clear the violation of WTO rules. So what can we do about it? No, I can、uh, I can speak freely. Although I have to be careful in、uh, legal. Opinions, because if there is a case in WTO, and I have expressed a view, then one of the lawyers would say, "Hey, Mr. Lamy, in Beijing, said this on this day, so this proves that I'm right and that you're wrong." So I have to be, I have to be careful. In general, export restrictions are banned by WTO. Which is why, for instance,、uh, China、uh, lost a case、uh, some years ago when it、uh, restricted its exports of rare earth. China got a case against China and lost the case. And the reason why they lost the case was that China argued that it was restricting. It's exports of rare earth、uh, because ex exploiting rare earth was not good for the environment, so we shouldn't exp exploit too much. And if we export, we exploit too much. The judge decided that you know, if、uh, it was bad enough for China to do it for itself, it was bad enough to do it for the others. So this is a case where export restrictions are clearly bad. Now. There is an article in the WTO code、uh, that、uh, says that you can restrict trade for reasons of national security, and the U.S. restrict exports of sensitive semiconductors to China on the grounds of national security. Now, the question is whether it's for WTO to judge whether a country is right or not in invoking national security. This is a very touchy issue. Now, not that it was not litigated. There was a ban between、uh, Russia. Uh, by, between、uh, Ukraine and Russia, and Russia took Ukraine to the dispute settlement of WTO, and Ukraine said、uh, they were、uh, doing it、uh, for national security reasons. And by the way, in that case, the U.S. sided with Russia. And in that case, the Dispute settlement said that it was not really national security. I'm a deep、uh, cosmopolitan. <laughs> I'm a deep internationalist, but I'm not sure it's a panel of three judges, in the non-elected judges, in the WTO that should decide whether a country. Is right or wrong in invoking national security for a trade measure? There has to be a possibility for a country to interpret its own security. It should not be overinterpreted. So I think there is, there are cases where it. I mean, take take the example of、uh, Trump tariffs on European steel and aluminium. The reason why he put tariffs 
on steel and, and European steel and aluminium is because of this was a danger for national security in the US. Now, this is crap. In the occurrence, the EU did not litigate, and I'm not sure I agree with this position, but let's uh, leave that aside. So in this case, it's obvious that it had nothing to do. The notion that producing steel or exporting steel or aluminium to the US when you're European is a threat to U US security is just nuts. So there is, there is a margin. So my answer to your question is a typical uh, lawyer answer. It depends. Uh, I think it's reasonable to say national security is something we have to really look uh, after. The difficulty is so hard to separate national security from non-national security. Hello, uh, Mr. Lamy. Uh, you're very uh, candid and very frank uh, for your dialogue, so thank you for your inputs. My question is about uh, uh, the one by one road initiatives. Uh, you know, uh, China government wants to have a close relationship with Europe, so uh, to have the, you know, Silk Road uh, rebuild the uh, trade between China and Europe. But uh, unfortunately, I would say, you know, only uh, of quite a few developed countries, developing countries join these initiatives. So what's your comment? Do you think this is uh, successful or, you know, any comment on that? Well, all uh, major economies on this planet have an objective interest in helping poorer developing countries develop. One can discuss whether this is a moral duty, whether uh, this is a solidarity uh, issue. Let's leave that aside. If I am a producer, I want to increase the number of my clients, and I want my clients to be richer rather than poorer. In, in a global market capitalist system, this is the rule. So all, the, all countries have an interest to do that. The US do that. Europe does that. China does that. And China chooses as a sort of slogan for its development assistance, Belt and Road Initiative, which is a clever way, by the way, better than the others do it and I will do it because the others do it a bit differently. So it's a typical formidable capacity of China to invent concepts which are very nice, sometimes a bit vague, in order to foster the representation of what China does. So for me, Belt and Road is no more and no less than a development assistance concept, tailored to the needs of China. Belt and Road Initiative is basically about building trade corridors and infrastructures in a situation where China knows that for the future it needs to import quite a lot of stuff, notably food, by the way, and given the Chinese specificity of a low consumption uh, and uh, high production, they have to export. Huh? So, Belt and Road is a building a pipe that will ensure in the future that China has benefits from the necessary infrastructures. It's clever. Now, as you know, it has had its ups and now a bit of down uh, because like others, like US, like EU later, the financing of these infrastructures has been done by China lending money 
uh, to the country that build the infrastructure. One of the sides of the equation was that most of the time, the one that built this infrastructure were Chinese and not national and not Europeans and not Americans. They were Chinese, and as you know, China is extremely good at building infrastructure. Look at this country. But there's been a bit too much lending, and now there's a bit of a problem in uh, getting reimbursed. We, uh, we have used up almost all of our time. How about we stay a little bit longer? Maybe one or two more questions? Okay, next question. 非常欢迎四年后您重新回到中国然后在过去几年我们在供应链在这个关税我天天还是要思考我怎么把这个企业的经营的状况有这种坏的方向往好的方向发展那我想请您的请教这个问题是从企业管理的角度在未来的这个刚才您提到并不是一个对未来的预期并不是很好那从企业管理的角度在企业决
strategy, in geopolitics, in geoeconomics, you leave aside during two years totally your technical business, whether you are in Navy, in the Air Force, and you are trained in understanding the world. And I think this, for the moment, is, uh, is the way to go. And it, it probably provides opportunities for some which were not there before. Huh? The one that will be clever enough to detect more before, than, before others the thing to do or the way to go. So understand the world, try to anticipate, anticipate what will change, the direction of a change in the future. That's uh, important and difficult. Last question. Uh, a female let, question. A let's female ask question. A, a lady. We have a female question. Yes. Good. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to know your opinion about uh, regionalization versus uh, globalization. Do you think the regionalization will be a drag force for uh, the globalization? For example, like TPT, a TPP lead by US. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, it's a question I've been uh, working on for what roughly. 15 years, maybe 20. Globalization, as I said, is a process of multilocalization that was facilitated by the reduction of obstacle to trade. This is done multilaterally. It can also be done bilaterally or regionally. Regional agreements, like the TPP, are agreements where trade is more open among some trade partners than they have done it multilaterally in the WTO. So it's WTO plus in terms of trade opening. Some academics, like uh, a uh, very famous uh, American Indian academist, uh, Jagdis Bhagwati, uh, pretend that these bilateral or regional agreements are a spaghetti bowl, that's his expression, that confuses the predictability, transparency of trade, and that they are not good. I am of the opposite view. Uh, I'm a believer in uh, the Chinese proverb uh, that says that don't mind the color of the cat uh, provided it catches mice. I don't mind whether it's a multilateral or a bilateral or a regional provided it reduces obstacle to trade it is good. Now there's a limit to that, which I need to acknowledge, which is when obstacle to trade are not with tariffs, not with quantitative restrictions, but with regulatory precautions. Sometimes exporting to a country is a problem because you export a service of architecture or dredging or accountancy and you cannot export it because the regulation is such that it's done in a way that you have a hard time adjusting to this and it's more costly to adjust to this regulation. Take the pharmaceutical industry, for instance, which is a formidably regulated industry. Now, in these cases, there may be a problem in creating a regulatory club that then will be for the club, for joining the club or exporting to this club, an obstacle for others. So there's a limit to that. And of course, the solution is to have multilateral standards, is to have multilateral norms. But this, which in my view is, is the key, is, uh, is a solution, but it's, it's complex and difficult to do. 
So in some areas, we will have a globalization, but with differences in regulations, which we have to accept. And this is the case in the, in the digital sector. We will have a Chinese regulation for data, a US, we have, and we will have, a US system, a Chinese system, an EU system, maybe one day an Indian system, and they will be different. Because the, the, the philosophy, the view we have about data is different. It's not the case for bicycles, or for meat, or for shoes, or for shirts. They are ideologically flat. Data are not ideologically flat. So this, in my view, is the problem for the future. But in a case like TPP, uh, which is, by the way, a, a very good standard of a WTO plus trade opening, it's a good quality, largely inspired by the Americans, by the way, and it's very much an American-like trade opening, although the US uh, stepped uh, out of it uh, when uh, Trump arrived. Uh, in this case, I don't think it's any threat to a progress in multilateral trade opening. I agree. I think a regional trading block can be a sub good supplement to a global trading system, but it cannot replace it. Time of wheel flies. Maybe we should do this again sometime uh, in a few months. Thank you very much. And uh, just a few words uh, to, to close. Uh, number one, I really think, I like what you said about the new technology. The technology will bring people together. So we are really living in a small world. So we should move forward. We should move together. The important thing is together. I don't want to make this uh, dialogue an anti-American forum. The second thing is uh, I think everything is about a compromise. And uh, if we want to move together, we have to make concessions. We cannot get 100% of what, I, what we want. In fact, Professor Nami, I think you should have confidence about the Chinese culture. When I was a kid, my grandmother told me this. In Chinese, it's like this. Shang ban ye xiang zi qi. The first half of the night when you sleep, you think about your own benefit and welfare. The second half of the night, you consider the welfare of others. So Chinese, this is a real Chinese tradition, and we, are, we don't believe winner takes all. So I think the Europeans and Americans should not really have this kind of irrational fear about uh, we are Chinese. And the third thing is I think we should have faith about uh, mankind. We should have faith about our future. And uh, this uh, dialogue, I think, can add some to our faith. Because people can talk together. People can understand the issue better. And uh, hopefully, if we have a lot of these kind of events, we can really solve the global problem. And, and I really, I want to say this again, the Europeans and the Chinese, we have a special responsibility. We have a special also ability to bring the world together. And I hope uh, yeah, as two professors of the same school, we can do more events like this. Thank you very much. Uh,